form this year. We just ran out of time. That, that's, that's the bottom line. Very different opinions between the House and the Senate, but the clock just ran out. Uh, we have to be done by midnight on July 31st on an election year, and uh, the clock just ran out. So I hope that with, with Glenn's support and everybody here and throughout the Commonwealth, that uh, we can pick up this conversation immediately uh, when the new session starts in January. Because I think I, I, I would hate to see, personally, another fiscal year budget get approved without trying to solve some of these problems. So we have a lot of work to do with a short period of time to do it. Would anyone have a question? Yes. Um, I see. <laughs> Cindy Taylor. Do you want to come up to the microphone? Oh, okay. <laughs> if you get away, we can hear. All right. <laughs> so, so um, we're at a time in government right now where people tend not to trust what's happening, right? I think we all pretty much agree with that. Um, and I was really wondering what happened in the final hours when things broke down in the, what is a private meeting um, between the House and Senate working out the details. So I'm, I know that that Saturday, everybody worked really late on um, that whole weekend trying to negotiate the right Chapter 70 funding, which would have been more in the Senate's. To, uh, we would all, excuse me, we would all have much rather had the Senate version that they passed, um, the foundation budget. And um, it seems like, I think, the House and the Senate passed the open meeting laws for school committees. They were the local group that has to be accountable for the budget. And then, but that decision for the chapter funding formula at the end was funded in, in a secret meeting. It was only that small group. There was no transparency. And so I really want to know what happened, what broke down that at the last minute, it seemed like the last minute, it didn't get passed the way it was originally proposed after um, the House and Senate committees spent, the Education Committee spent so long studying, coming out to our district, um, Berkshire County, all over the state, getting hearings on what needed to happen to make children and children's education a, a, the priority it should be. And then it fell apart, but there was never really, in my opinion, um, and this, you know, is, I'm not directing this specifically at you, but I feel like we never got an adequate explanation about what broke down because there's no open meeting laws in in your committees, like we have to hold true to in ours. Yeah, well, and, and very simple, like I said earlier, we, the clock ran out. We had a difference of opinion on how to fund it. A lot of us were very dependent, especially in the House, on the millionaire's tax proposal that was going to be on the ballot this November. And at the 11th hour, the state Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional. And they said, so that kind of took yeah. a billion and a half to $2 billion that we thought we were going to have for transportation and education off the table without a new revenue stream. So the differences between the House and the Senate were very dramatic. Um, we just could not reach an agreement. That's the bottom line. Uh, I never want to be too critical of my colleagues, but we were scheduled to be there the entire weekend. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday was the 31st. The Senate changed leadership on Thursday. They had the third Senate president in less than a year, and then they chose to go home for the weekend. We had representatives who booked hotel rooms to be there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. We went home because there was nobody to talk to. So there's a lot of moving parts with this. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I buy the argument about the open meeting law and whatnot because I served on a conference committee this year for a, a two and a half billion dollar bond bill. Um, three reps, three senators, we went behind closed doors and we hammered out the differences between the two. We got it done. Unfortunately, on the Chapter 70, we couldn't get it done because there was nobody to talk to because they chose to go home for the weekend, we, knowing we had a deadline of July 31st. We felt very upset by that. The Speaker made it very clear that he was disappointed in that. We had a lot of things to do, not only just Chapter 7. We had the Safe Communities Act, we had to finalize the budget, and for three out of the last five days, we didn't have a dance partner. Smitty, could you explain to the group of millionaires tax? Well, the millionaires tax, as you all know, was going to be a 4% additional tax. If you made over a million dollars a year, um, you would pay 4% more than what we pay in our regular income tax. Now, if you made a million and one dollar, you would only pay the one, the 4% on that one dollar. Um, we had great support. We voted on it twice. 
uh, to bring it to the ballot. That was a legislative requirement. The House and the Senate endorsed it for two successive sessions. Um, why the Supreme Court didn't weigh in earlier, it would have been much better and much easier for us to have known this a year ago. We maybe could have shifted gears and tried to come up with a better revenue stream. But the millionaire's tax was pretty much a millionaire's tax. If you made over a million dollars, you paid a higher income tax. Uh, a baseball analogy that I used, I, I looked at David Price, the pitcher for the Boston Red Sox. Um, he was making $36 million this year. That's about a million dollars for every start that he made this year. And I'm thinking, damn right, he should pay a little bit more than me. He can afford to do it. Um, whether he pitched one inning or pitched a no-hitter, pitched four <clears throat> innings or a pitched a complete game, he was making a million dollars a start. So, you know, people like that who can afford to pay a little bit more money should be able to afford to pay a little bit more money. We had great support in the legislature, both the House and the Senate, uh, but unfortunately the Supreme Court kind of threw a curveball at us. And then we didn't have the revenue stream to deal with it any longer. And then the clock ran out. Can't cover it all for us there? Yeah, you can't, no. <laughs> so at this point, I would like to welcome uh, State Representative Trish Farley Bouvier, if I got those right, sometimes I like to mix them up, and our State Senator Adam Hine. Welcome here. Sorry. At this point, we're taking questions from the audience. Uh, Glenn Kutcher went over Chapter 70 and the functions of it and how, how it comes together and how we compare two towns. And Smitty has just addressed a question why the state and House versions didn't quite make it to the vote at the last minute. Another question? Yes. Can I just kind of speak in my loud voice? Give us your best cheerleader voice. Oh, okay, need louder? Louder? Okay. <laughs> uh, if I could take back to where, where Smitty was talking about what happened at the end of the fiscal year. One of the things that I've never heard an answer on that I sure appreciate now that we have both Smitty and, and Senator Hines here uh, are the, the, this whole question of the billionaire's tax and, and that last minute of the uh, state Supreme Court uh, decision on that. Uh, during that whole process, you know, the, the, the newspapers were full of the fact that that was questionable and but there was a lot of discussion, so it didn't seem to me that that should have been a really huge surprise, but that it also probably should have been taken care of earlier, you know, instead of like in the last day. Could anybody explain that a little bit better? Because a uh, number of people that, that I'm associated with have said, how, how did that ever happen, that they were both surprised by that Supreme Court decision? Well, I, I'll let Trisha and, and Adam Wayne as well, but I, I was surprised at what I would call the last minute ruling. Now, it was very controversial, got a lot of media, no question about it, a lot of people were for the tax, a lot of people were against the tax. Um, but uh, the ruling from the Supreme Court, I think, did catch us by surprise. Here we were, what, six months from the ballot vote, and after something that we've all went through for two successive sessions, legislative sessions, which are required to, what, 50 votes or more, and the House uh, to, to move this thing forward, and the Senate endorsed it as well, uh, we, we already did that twice, and now we're just a few short months from actually you having a chance to vote on it, then the court weighs in on it. So I, I guess, I'm not sure how it got to the court to make that ruling. I guess uh, I would like to know that. Maybe Trisha Adam does remember that. Um, but this was two or three years in the making, if not longer. And then with just a few months to go, the court said no. So I think it caught us all by surprise. And sadly, if we had a better revenue stream, we could have kind of plugged and placed uh, with something else, but we didn't have the revenue stream to do that. So I'll just add to what Smitty was saying. He's absolutely right that there's some of some of it was a was a surprise. Here are the things that were a surprise: um, the fact that it was controversial. That wasn't a surprise. Um, the fact that we got 50 out of 200 votes out of the legislature, you know, two sessions in a row. That wasn't a surprise. Um, there's you know broad base support for the millionaires tax. There's no question about it. Probably the two things that, well, certainly this, a big surprise for me is how long the court took to decide. So they, they really didn't decide, was it like a, within a week before session ended? And we had been waiting for that for months for that decision. The other thing was that, you know, it was a 5-4 decision. It was really close as to whether that was going to pass or not. 
And um, and so it wasn't something like, oh, this is obvious that, that the court is gonna, is gonna shut it down. And it shut it down really on a technicality and you know, weigh in if people, oh, I got this right, but they're saying it, it's totally fair to, to levy this tax. What they What is not okay is for you to um, compel future legislatures to spend the money in this way. So it was kind of a small part of that that, that they threw out. And so we have to start over again. So when it comes to Chapter 70 and that millionaire's tax, what we know, and this is probably what you talked about before, is that we're underfunding Chapter 70 by $2 billion a year. And so all this fight about how we fund it, it's we're all fighting over the crumbs, right? The, the, the real solution is to get more revenue. The millionaire's tax, I believe, is a good way to do it. It's very fair, I believe. First million dollars, everybody pays the same amount. Um, and then you know your income, not your assets, but your income over a million is taxed at an additional 4%. I believe is a very fair thing. So um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Senator. Yeah. But I guess I think you've heard the answer on the um, millionaire's tax, but I think uh, maybe what I'll chime in on is that what happened at the 11th hour, literally the 11th hour, July 31st, and um, and it was it really did come down, as far as I can tell, to that uncertainty of. Um, you know, is this $1.2 billion surplus that we experienced this year sustainable? If not, then what position does that put the legislature in later? Um, if you want an interesting read, I don't know if you've talked about it, but look at the, the Senate chairs of, of education's Twitter feed on August 1st, um, Sonia Chain Diaz, and, um, and it really starts to lift up the lid on, um, on the, the kind of the chaos in those last hours of, of July 31st. Uh, and the frustration, I think, that, that everyone was feeling. Uh, that, that makes me think that, okay, great, then if we're going into next year and saying, well, then the problem is, uh, well, let me start that over. I think the good news out of the way that session ended was the political will, or the, I mean, the political ability to, to not pass FBRC another year, it just seems to me unsustainable. It seems to me that in my reaction from hearing from a lot of you uh, to seeing it, the reactions across the state, you can't get away with that anymore. Um, enough is enough. And that's, that's basically the way we've all felt. That's basically what I've heard from all of you. And yet it's still, we come back disappointed. Um, and I feel like the, the uh, that, that you can't have that this year. And so I feel slightly more optimistic that next year we'll, we will see changes. I think um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, who's in these committees and and what kind of um, deals we can broker. But you know, this and a few other issues have to be at the top of the list of this this next session. And if I could just add to that, I think Trisha and Adam nailed it. Um, it comes down to money. Where does the money come from? Like everything else, um, and that's the, been the problem. I. I don't get really overly excited about these foundation review commissions. It has to be done. we got to find a way to fund it. In my 16 years, this is probably the third or fourth foundation review commission that we've had. And at the end of the day, there's winners and there's losers. The winners get more money. The losers get less money. If anybody in this, in this uh, auditorium right now loses money, you're going to be hollering enough to vote against that because that's a bad reform. If every one of you gets more money, you're going to be coming to us and say, please support this. That's been the disconnect. There's winners and there's losers, and until we find that, I, what I would call a hold harmless provision, where we have winners and losers, but we hold the losers harmless for maybe three to five years, so they can weather the storm and adjust and adapt, uh, but until we find that opportunity, here we go, another foundation review commission that we can't reach a resolution to, and it's been frustrating, but I think there's a different momentum here. I think Adam is absolutely right. There's a different momentum uh, going into this new legislative session in January that recognizes we have to do this. We're having people in schools slipping backwards. That can no longer continue. The burden on the local municipalities and the local taxpayers is growing. The state's got to step up. But if any of you have any creative ideas now that the millionaire's tax is gone, uh, where to find that additional revenue that could have be a broad-based support 
because I do believe the millionaire's tax did have broad-based support, and I believe it would have passed the ballot. We need to find that magic bullet again, and if, we, if you can help us find that, I think uh, we'll have a reform, we'll have a winner and a loser, let's weather the storm and, uh, and move forward for the greater good of the kid, educating of our kids. I'm just going to add quickly so we don't belabor it, but you know, the next day I was on the phone with my folks from Pittsfield because um, some of them they heard it from me first, they hadn't heard it from the news and they hadn't gotten their pitchforks out yet. Um, and you know, I explained what happened and I said, keep the pressure on us. And that's what I guess I'm asking all of you is, you know, maybe you don't have to bring pitchforks with you, but the pressure that we feel from home can translate into action at the state house. And so when I can go to the speaker, when I can go to the chair of education, when I can go to the chair of ways and means and say, this is the most important issue in Pittsfield, it will make a difference. So, um, you know, I believe in grassroots organizing. I believe in, in, in uh, local organizing and, and to bring that up. So, so keep at it. Keep having meetings like this. Keep doing it. But I would urge you all that the former vice chair many, many years ago had a sign in his office. It was right on his desk. Are you here with the problem or are you offering a solution? So yeah, keep the pressure on. We already know the problem. Offer, offer us a solution. We thought the solution was the millionaire's tax. That is no longer an option for us. So come to us with solutions and let's stay organized. Yes. All right, um, I'm Bill Fields from Bertrand Hills. I'd like to know what the two plans from the, the Senate and the House were that caused the problem. Okay, what were the plans first? And then where was the problem in kind of reconciling those two differences in the conference committee? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can take this on and then I'm gonna have backup from the guys on either side of me. So basically there was broad agreement um, on, we talked about, you guys just had the tutorial on, on the four buckets, right? I wish I was here for the tutorial. Um, let's see if I can remember. There, are, there were issues on, on, there was consensus on two, and there was non, there, there, the, the, there wasn't consensus on what the data was on the other two, and they wanted that information, the House <coughs> chair wanted that information before passing all of it. And, um, you know, this, I, I don't want to get into, like, battles between the House and Senate and all that kind of stuff because I don't feel like that's that productive. The, the Senate was, rep, was willing to take a leap, and the House said, we need this data before we move forward. Um, I believe we're going to see... Well, she said it, and I didn't have to. <laughs> was ready to um, the... The, I believe that in the 2020 budget, you're going to see significant, um, whether the, the form is exactly passed by then or not, I think that's another question, just timing-wise, the way the budget comes out compared to when, when the legislation comes out compared to budget. But I think you're going to see significant differences in the education, the K-12 budget, Chapter 7 budget next year. That's the leap I'm going to take because so many of us know not only at the local level, but at, at the legislative level, how important this is. I, 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 you know, the House, all politics is local. Tip O'Neill, famous for saying that. You know, we are, Trish and I are blessed to represent representative districts out here. We have colleagues, go down to Worcester County, very Republican. Go to Cape Cod, becoming very Republican, meaning very conservative legislators who represent rooms like you, who's saying, don't raise my taxes. So that's the, the battle where the Senate, yeah, they were willing to take the big leap, and money was no object. We were forced, because of the, the membership that we have statewide, to take a little slower, more conservative approach. So we were hoping to get something out of it, but unfortunately we couldn't get together at the end of the day, and like I'll say again and again and again tonight, the clock simply ran out. I wish it was July 31st a year ago, because we'd be back in session today, continuing this conversation. But on election years, we're required to be done, and that's why nothing's going to happen until January. So uh, we have a very different tact in the House, which is a little bit more reserved, a little bit more conservative than the Senate. That's just a fact. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yes, Mr. Campbell. What precludes um, the general court from redrafting re uh, the millionaire's tax so that it conforms to what the SJC said was wrong with it and, re and passing it again in a corrected format? So presumably it couldn't dedicate money, the additional money in perpetuity, but it would certainly add $2 billion or a billion and a half dollars to the state revenues. So is there some reason why that couldn't be done? So it absolutely can be done, and I think it absolutely will be done. But it takes a vote of 25% of the combined legislature um, at a constitutional convention over two consecutive sessions. So we have a session coming up, the 2019-2020 session. Then we have to go to the next session, take the vote again, and then it can go to the ballot. So this was a constitutional amendment. This is that's the whole point. Yeah, to change nice. taxes is a constitutional amendment. And we therefore we voted on the previous version uh, and not the new one, so we have to start over. So, so, so the I, best I, case scenario is three years? Yeah. So I, I'm I'm in hopes that and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm in hopes that the conversations I believe are going on continually between the House and the Senate so that we can tee this thing up in January. Maybe without the millionaire's tax, but some way to reach an agreement. And if our revenue streams continue to grow, which they have grown, knock on wood, unemployment is down, revenues are, are up. If those trends continue, um, I don't think we can wait four or five more years for Thanks. us to rewrite this whole millionaire's tax and start the process all over again. Yes, sir. we we have to have to be be straight with you here. One of the reasons for the delay was that we asked the House to slow down so we could figure out an accurate count of our kids at economic disadvantage. So I, I mentioned that earlier. And, and we said to Alice Peich, look, we don't want to lose the extra revenue to some of our neediest communities. You know, we, we can wait. In other words, if there's money, the legislature can give us temporary relief to the extent that it can next year. Uh, but we wanted to get that situation in. I mentioned this before you came. We've got some of our communities with hundreds of kids that are undocumented that we can't count yet because we haven't figured it out. We've got economically disadvantaged kids. We used to count them by who had free and reduced lunch. Then the feds changed the rules so there'd be fewer kids. So the legislature put more money per kid in but because they haven't counted all the kids yet, because we don't know who they are, because if they come forward, they might get deported. That's a technical issue, and we had to work that out, and that's a very tough issue. So, in fact, they tried to figure it out, and it was just too complicated a, a situation to respond that quickly for. One other thing that uh, I think we all had to realize is that any of the promises that the bill was going to bring more money had to be weighed against whether the economy actually provided it. And people forgot that uh, we every district has been in foundation budget now for about 18 years because the legislature provided all that money between 1993 and 2000, which were the seven years of greatest economic growth in the history of the United States. So the money was there. The money hasn't been there since. So we've been pleading and complaining as best we can, but so is everybody else, the Children's Services Safety Net. So it's not easy. But for this one, the blame has to be shared with us and the superintendents who said, on behalf of the districts with poor kids, don't speed this thing up and leave us out. Take the time to do it right. And that's the principal reason for the we were the people who were and I'm, I'm going to add another thing to what's been happening over the last, I don't know, five or six years, um, you might be able to pin that down, is that there's been efforts to say, well, we haven't figured this out yet, so while you're figuring it out, can you guarantee us $25 per student addition in, in, the, in, the, in our Chapter 70? $50. I think one year we got $55. I think that's a really bad idea.
because I think it just continues to kick the can down the road and we can't address the underlying issues that we have here in the Berkshires um, with, with our poor students, with our, our English as second language students, and with the declining enrollment, how is that, you know, extra dollar per student helping us? So um, I, you know, I have been against that effort um, in the House, um, but it, it has a lot of support um, in the House because they're like, well, at least I can go back to my school districts and tell them I got you this much more money. Um, but, uh, you know, I would like that effort to stop, honestly, so we could have really address the challenges. Uh, yes. Question: Skipping the two billion dollars, did the actual foundation budget formula change? I mean, so with the money we have, is it going equitably to where it should be going? Even though some districts will lose and some will gain, did the formula actually so change? So the formula, nothing has changed because the legislation hasn't changed. Okay. So until the, when the legislation does get passed, and I think it will. Then there'll be a change. Do you think that's did I characterize that correctly? I mean, we didn't pass the bill. Okay, so, so pass the bill. It's still, as like it was, twenty-five years ago. Okay. Basically. Um, yes. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> what? Well, thanks. <laughs> My name's Rob Riley. I live in the People's Republic of Lanesboro, and I'm on the McCann School Committee. And there's a couple of things that strike me through this, and, and I'm not sure how to make sense of it. Uh, Representative Farley Bouvier a little bit ago said, yeah, but we have to generate revenue. And I, I keep going back and forth with the idea that, for me, it's not really a big deal that we don't get the Patriots. It's not really a big deal. That's not the takeaway that we don't get Massachusetts TV stations, but the takeaway for me is the people who generate revenue in this world the corporate world doesn't pay attention to or they're not really in, impressed by political borders anymore. So Massachusetts seemed, especially this end of it, th that there's a takeaway, that there's a gem of wisdom in there somewhere. There, and, and I think what also gets in the way is Massachusetts, and, and I say People's Republic of Lanesboro, tongue in cheek a little bit, it, it seems that in Uber Home Rule Massachusetts, that sort of gets in the way too of generating revenue of what the task force is thinking about school system sharing services. That seems to be a roadblock to, to doing good things, not so much revenue maybe, but the other thing is the, the revenue, that bothers me and I'm trying to make sense of we don't get the Patriots, we don't get Massachusetts TV stations, but there's a reason. The people who generate revenue are really good at generating revenue in the corporate world, and I think the legislature needs to start thinking about how do we do that, but political borders seem to get in the way, and I'm not smart enough to give an answer. It's just a real big question that seems to keep coming up and hitting me in the face a little bit. Thank you. Revenue generation. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I'll just say this. We have a system for collecting revenue that belongs in the 20th century. Sure. And we need a way to collect revenue for the 21st century. Referring to online sales. And right. Things like that. Airbnb. Um, and then the other thing that, that doesn't quite seem to get over the finish line either is regional ballot initiatives, which are typically identified for transportation. But it's, it speaks to this, um, and Smitty references, I mean, there's a general um, you know, allergy to taxation, revenue generation, and so you better come to the table with a very sharp pencil when you do, I think, and, and so that's, uh, it, it's, I, I get hit over the head on this all the time personally as well when you're out and about, and so um, it seems intuitive to us that, okay, great, then we're, but we, we're going to put education at the top of the list, education and healthcare maybe, um, and, and, you know, go from there, and yet even there, that doesn't seem strong enough a narrative to, to, to take the next step in these cases. And if I could add to the revenue uh, discussion, it was probably what, seven, eight years ago that we voted for casino gambling. That was going to be the economic panacea. That was going to solve all of our problems. The first casino just opened two weeks ago or a month ago in Springfield. So we haven't seen that revenue. 
couple years ago, they voted to uh, legalize a recreational use of marijuana. That was going to be a panacea of revenue for us. Well, that's not fully, fully unrolled yet as well. Um, but sent me a note here, and he's absolutely right about uh, sports betting and the lottery. You know, uh, with the uh, U.S. Supreme Court about online gambling and the, you know, the DraftKings and those organizations, there's an un untapped opportunity, I believe, that we tax them appropriately as well. Um, that's a conversation I wish was going on right now and not kick the can. And I think Trish is absolutely right. We keep kicking the can down the line. So, you know, the old attitude is don't tax me, don't tax, how does it go? Don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. <laughs> That's what local option taxes are all about. I know what the Hotel Motel did for the town of Lennox. It saved Lennox from bankruptcy nearly 30 years ago. Uh, now we're debating Airbnb. Uh, we have the meals tax, local option. I have filed, a, at the request of the town of Lee, a local option gas tax that could generate three or $400,000 for the town of Lee to help with the infrastructure. That finally got out of committee. We can't even pass a five cent deposit on a water bottle. You know, it's easy in the Berkshires, but don't talk to talk to our colleagues on the on the North Shore, the border of New Hampshire. They are definitely afraid of a five cent deposit on even a water bottle. So it's easy to say, oh, pick that revenue stream. Well, we have to sell it to 200 other legislators, and that's always been the hard part. So uh, we, we keep chugging at it. I think the online gambling is a real opportunity for us, and I think our state treasurer should get ahead of this as well because uh, the lifeline to our municipalities called local lottery aid is going to see a big hit if we allow too much to be happening online without getting that revenue stream as well. So we have a lot to do come January. These conversations are starting to take place now, but nothing officially can happen until we all take the oath of office on, I think, January 5th this uh, coming year. Can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> um, this is, a, I viewed this, this, you all know this is my first term, and I always viewed this kind of three month period as being a key moment to check in and essentially say, what is it that we should be filing in the new year? What is it that we should be, um, you know, this week I'm meeting with the Senate president, and, you know, what is it that we need to bring back? Um, and, and so my question is, FBRC is at the top of the list. Um, what else? I mean, so we're, we're I just got appointed to a regional um, school transportation commission, um, which I'm ecstatic about because this is long overdue and that's, uh, that's as uh, big a lift as we can get. I and mean, we got it up to 80% this year, but um, having this commission is gonna be another one to work on. Obviously the rural school aid is another one that's been a priority of mine. Um, and um, special, special ed circuit breaker, fully funding. What else do I need to be focused on before for Well, we're going to head the, com the uh, committees in the state house, especially the finance committees and the ones that have all the power, because I think that's the only thing that's finally going to give us the adequate education funding. And um, so what are you going to do, guys, to help that happen? Can you just start? What was the first sentence the first you sentence said? The was that the, the, um, the number, I was at your, um, at the thing at the, the very few stages that was women in leadership, the senior of that film that was about yeah. women in leadership. Yeah. And one of the things that you said, Patricia, that really rang true with me is that the women are not heading up the really powerful committees in the state house. So the, the, the uh, committees that deal with finance and that hold the, the weight to purse strings. And so what, what can we do to make sure that more women hold the seats of power, the votes that are going to give us the adequate funding for education? Because to me, it's, and we're in Massachusetts, we're the home of Harvard, Radcliffe, um, Wells, and all these top schools, MIT, and it's about the will to, to fund education adequately. It's not about, um, do we really have the money? We have the brain power, we have the money. We have the money, so we make it a priority. And so what I'm saying is, if maybe if the women are on those very influential committees that hold the purse strings, we can do more for education, because right now, all this, uh, the data was gathered from all over the state about what needs to happen. And here we are having this conversation about all our eggs in one basket, this millionaire's tax. And, and I think Mr. Kutcher said a while ago, everybody is claiming that money for what they want to see funded. And there's no guarantee it's going to go to education. So we can't look at it like, okay, with one bullet it's going to fix everything. It's not going to happen. We have to make education for all a priority. 
finally, it has to be a priority in the state. And we, we can't keep looking at these ridiculously false facts about we're number one in the country in education. Really, we're not. I mean, we're, so, you know, let the truth come out. We're not number one in education for every child at all. There's so many children being left behind. And it's just, I, I, I don't buy it that we can't do it. I really don't. It's about the will to do it. Well, thank you, um, Cindy. Um, you know, so much of that I agree with you on. Um, I will say that the two chairs of education are right. both strong and very influential women um, on both the, the Senate and, and the House side. The president of the Senate is a very strong woman who has um, she a joined, strong- um, because of education, she yeah, joined the legislature. The very strong background in um, education and protecting the most vulnerable um, of, of our neighbors. Um, you know, the House, um, chair. The chair of Ways and Means and the Vice Chair yep. of Ways and Means is a woman. Um, so there's going to be two new chairs <laughs> of Ways and Means um, on both the House and the Senate side. So that is um, up, you know, to, to be seen what will happen. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, the legislature, when it comes to women in leadership, um, that the, the legislature does what happens all over the country. We make progress and we fall back as far as a uh, number of women. We make progress and we fall back. Um, I will tell you that I'm being joined um, by four women um, from uh, in Western Massachusetts from the Pioneer Valley, which makes me personally happy. Um, but I think the biggest message um, that I would have in response to that is I don't think when it comes to when it comes to education, truly, when it comes to education, I think. Um, understanding education, understanding the value that education has on a person's life is much more of a criteria for um, getting leadership into those positions than gender is. Um, and I, um, I haven't seen um, anywhere in, in leadership that deciding to fund education um, has anything to do um, with gender. So. I, I, I have to say, I have to spoke more globally about that, mm -hmm. women being in more. Um, the chairing committee was very competitive personally. I, but I was using education as an example because we're not we're not making progress <coughs> like we should. And even so it seemed like even though the head of this committee, Sonia Jane Diaz and Alice Price, studied this thoroughly across the state for so long and at the last minute and, and gave information to everybody somehow it, it just it didn't translate and we need to do this. Well, and if I could just add to that, those two powerful women, I think Trisha nailed it, hit the nail on the head. These two powerful women in the Senate and the House Education Committee couldn't reach an agreement. So it has nothing to do with gender. It's a commitment. I think they're both committed to funding education, but they just took different paths and couldn't meet at the detour. Um, that, that was the problem. It comes down to money. It comes down to where does the money come from. That's in our own households. That's how it works. You know, I want to do my kitchen over, but I need a new roof. It's about establishing priorities. We have a $40 billion budget in Massachusetts. Over 40% of it's healthcare related. So if you say you want to have less people on healthcare so we can fund education, I don't think you're saying that. We got to find the money. You know, it's 40% of our $40 billion goes directly to healthcare. The first state in the country to require health insurance for every man, woman, and child. And right now we're at what, 97.5% people covered with health insurance in Massachusetts. That's something we should all be very proud of. You know, but if there's not new revenue coming in, I'll go back to Deval Patrick. He had a pre pretty interesting proposal a few years ago. I think we should revisit that. He talked about making a more progressive income tax and lowering the sales tax. That would pay huge dividends for us as well. So we can't just raise one tax and lower the other and have it be a wash of revenue coming into the state. So we gotta get really creative with our thinking, but we need the money. Show me the money. Uh, the, the millionaire's tax was gonna be the savior, and I agree with you. It was probably spent five different times by different factions. We had the engineers who wanted to do roads and bridges. We had the educators who wanted to do education. We had the healthcare advocates who wanted to fix healthcare. You know, at some point in time, we were committed, I believe, and I think the legislature that voted to move this thing forward was committed to education and transportation. I believe that's where our priorities would have been if we had the opportunity to find that revenue. And unfortunately, we didn't. Does anyone else have um, agenda, agenda items for the legislators? Go ahead. Well, 
I think that's the McKinney v. Vinto <coughs> Act, and so that's funny. That's funny that the state is required to pay for students that are placed because of homelessness. Can, can, I, ask, can I ask for a show of hands? If, if we were able to solve, had pixie dust, we're going to fix all the problems tonight. We solved SPED, we solved health insurance, and for a lot of you here, we solved the transportation. Would that be a victory? Not as many hands as I thought would walk, to be honest with you. That didn't work well. <laughs> no, I'm saying, but, 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 you know, you're, you're doing one-offs, like school nurses. I just gave you three. That, that's where the money is. And not every hand went up. I just offered you an opportunity. Let's fix spend. Let's fix transportation. And let's fix health insurance. You're all on the school committee. Tell me those aren't nooses around your neck when it comes to budget. If we fix those, would that help? Let's try it again. <laughs> those are the solutions we need to try to find. Because those aren't going to go away. Those aren't going to go away. Dennis? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to say, it seems like everywhere in the legislation, you're tripped into higher expense or something could be fixed. Every little bit. I don't disagree. So, um, Jake McCandless is there. How much How much uh, money did you get for uh, transportation? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Dennis Sears, how much money did you get for transportation? Do I give? Yeah, no, he's selling merch. You don't me, I'll give much No, 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 no but, but, but my, my point is, some get regional school transportation, some. others do not. <laughs> So they're, again, we're on there fighting all the time, all three of us, and Paul Mark as well, and John Barrett, fighting for regional school transportation. Well, it's hard to convince them. I, I hate to use Tricia. No, I know, but you know what? It's true. When I go, I, every time there's a regional transportation fight, I'm in it, even though it doesn't help my district It doesn't help her district all. at all. So that, those and are the And I struggles. just think it's fair. So do we, do we give money to everybody, or do we not give you any money because they don't get it? Well, yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. And, and, and there again, winners and losers. This is, goes back to the same old argument. <coughs> yeah. Uh, what, I, what I still question me is, if I could ask one other question, rather than have to leave with us and you know, spend more time than you should beating you guys up for trying to call us, uh, one of the things that came up earlier in Glenn's conversation that kind of stuck in my mind is that the, the, the quote, invisible kids, i.e., the, you know, the unregistered, the undocumented kids that we have in the schools. And you know, Glenn was discussing that, that well, the, the issue that's probably gone on for X years, I mean, I've heard this for some period of time, that, you know, well, nobody knows who they are. Well, if there's any group of people that might be able to help fix that problem, it's the people that are in here. I mean, uh, we tend to know who's in our schools. You know, and is there something that you can ask us that we can do 
that can help fix that problem. Maybe that's not that's not like getting another millionaire's tax, but anything that that if we can help do something for you in that area, yeah, I, I, I think that we are a mechanism, you know, without without putting my superintendent on the spot, but <laughs> but I, I think that we would have more knowledge than anybody else on who those invisible kids are. Yeah. I think that's a great point, and I think uh, our, the local censuses are critically important. Um, next year or the year after, we'll be doing a, another federal census, and I know for a fact that Lee got hurt by those same people and families not filling out the census form. That was 10 years ago. Now, with the current president and the fear about immigration, that fear is going to be there, amplified, I believe, this time around. But Lee, how many, were there 20 or 30 kids, Jake, possibly? That financially hurt Lee 10 years ago because they were afraid to fill out the census form. So if anybody can help reassuring these folks that no one's going to be knocking on your door, we're here to help you, it's a, it's a good community, we're here all in this thing together, but 20 or 30 kids not being accounted for has a financial burden because they're actually in the classroom, but we officially don't think they're in the classroom. That has a financial consequence. I guess what, what I'm saying is, and I'll sit down and shut up, is, is that is there something maybe we can do together? Because I think what you're talking about, I'm talking about something that would require, we have to do something, but we may need some legislative support from you to be able to do that, to be able to, in effect, do it in a manner where we don't scare all the parents of those kids away and scare the kids themselves away. Yeah. So it should be something maybe we can do together. Yep. I would agree. I would fill out the census. I wouldn't even Yeah. All right. <laughs> so... Is everyone good with other topics? Okay, Kelly, sure. To those